No Women in Heaven. A very interesting study coming up here. And uh, the scriptures are going to be our final authority. Um, there's going to be a lot of emotion and things in this study in terms of what my viewers and people viewing this video will be very emotional about this. And they'll say, you don't know what you're talking about and whatever else and things. But we're going to have the scriptures. We're going to go through the scriptures. And if I miss anything, put it in the comment section down below. I'm certainly open to correction on this. But uh, we're going to go through the scriptures. And I'm going to show you what the Bible has to say about the subject of do Christian women become men when they go to heaven? Um, that's the thing here. It's not that there's no saved women or something like that. That's not what I'm saying by this study. And it's uh, going to be a bit of a surprise at the end. Because I'm going to show you what the scriptures say, and then I'm going to show you something that uh, contradicts that other position. So, um, should be a good time if you love the Word of God, the King James Bible. Don't mess with the new versions from the Vatican. Uh, they're not real Bibles. They're false. They have satanic spirits in them. I've dealt with those new versions for many years. I have a huge collection of most of the ones down here and other places and things as well. I know them very well. Uh, they come from a corrupt source. Uh, they're Egyptian Bibles. They're not uh, Syrian uh, New Testament. Anyhow, that's another issue, which I've talked about. But let's start out here, Matthew chapter 22, verse 23 through 30. And you need a King James Bible, okay? You need to be following along in a print King James Bible. If you don't have one right now, we'll get, you know, look it up online or something like that. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Look at the scriptures. The scriptures are your final authority, not me, right? But if you don't have a print King James Bible, look it up online, but try to make an effort to get a good King James Bible. Uh, look, uh, do a YouTube search here on my channel for uh, the best KJV Bibles. And I'll show you the ones that are best. Matthew chapter 22, verse 23. Let's begin there. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were, now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Okay? Now, that's a legitimate question in terms of if that scenario actually happened, which quite frankly you know it didn't. They're just making it up. Sort of a philosophical, well what happens if someone... So if somebody would marry this and do this and do that, what would you say then? I get those questions all the time. Um, you know, endless genealogies, foolish questions, doting about, you know, foolish questions and things. These philosophical questions. Well, what if, you know, and you know that they're just lying. There, there's nobody actually that actually went through this whole thing here that this would actually happen. That every one of the brothers, they were all single, seven of them, and they all married the same woman and then, you know, they all died, and then she died also. Come on. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to trap Jesus. But let's look at what Jesus responds, and then we'll get back to this other thing here. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. That's the problem with you people out there that get offended at this ministry. Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, okay, nor the power of God. This is the book right here. Look at verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay, we're going to look at what angels are in the New Testament. But um, if this had been a real story, um, why wouldn't there have been an issue? If there are women in heaven, that you go up to heaven, you're a woman here on the earth, and you go up to heaven, you're a woman up there, um, there would be an issue. There would be something there. You say, well, they would just be single up there and whatever else. Well, you know, maybe. I don't know. But uh, we're going to see what the Bible has to say about um, angels and what angels are. But first, let's go to another parallel passage here. Luke chapter 20. Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
you're newly coming to the Bible. You'll learn the different books of the Bible and the sequence of them and everything else later. It takes a little bit of time. You can always go to the front, pause this video, and go to the front of your Bible to the table of contents. Look up where the different books are. Uh, Luke chapter 20 and uh, verse 34 through 36. We'll read that. Read the, a parallel passage here. Uh, it says here, And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. You say, well, see, it says children. That could be man and woman. Sons and daughters. That'd be children, right? You could make that argument. But again, they're compared to angels. You say, but it's just as the angels. They're as. It's not that they are angels. It's just that as. Uh, well, then you have a problem because this passage here says they are equal unto the angels. All right, you say, but it still could be something different. But why fight the text? All right. <laughs> um, and I'm going to be showing you this is going to be a big study today. But let's go back here to Judges, way back into the Old Testament to the book of Judges. And we're going to have an appearance of Jesus Christ, not a theophany or some kind of thing like this. These, you know, theologians have to come up with all kinds of new terms and whatever to explain away the parts of the Bible that they don't understand. Um, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is a reference to Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate form. Well, I don't know if I can believe it. Well, okay, whatever. Then believe in your fancy little theosophical or, or theological type of stuff. Well, probably theosophical as well. Um, Judges chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come un again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God, hearken, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife, and came to the man, and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I command, let her command her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee, until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Huh? Why not? Shouldn't a guy be standing there with big feather wings off of his back, you know, coming up, big feather wings like that? He doesn't know that he's an angel of the Lord? Huh. Um, you say, well, well angels, uh, they're sexless. They're, you know, they don't have a, you know, they're not male or female. Um, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. There's no sexless uh, angels or anything in here. No, that's not the issue. They're male. That's why in heaven, there's no marriage, because they're all male. Angels can't marry each other. But continuing here, verse 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when uh, thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? It's kind of an interesting thing. He's there in a pre-incarnate form. Jesus Christ is there in a pre-incarnate form. His name hasn't been revealed yet. It's revealed in the New Testament. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife uh, looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife 
Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. So he didn't know it at first when he's looking at him. He's just thinking it's a regular looking man. But then the, the fire's going up and things and, and he goes whoop, up in the flame. Hmm. An interesting thing. But look at verse 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Huh. Is the angel of the Lord God? Mm hmm. A physical appearance of God. Not some magical kind of a thing, and they, they come up with a theophany. Theophany is not a Bible word. It's just a pre-incarnate, pre-incarnate, you know, appearing of Jesus Christ. He has a physical body. The Godhead always was made up of a body, soul, spirit. There's no point in time when that was just kind of misty little spirits in the past or something. No, there's no proof of that. There's always been a body, soul, spirit. I firmly believe that. But the Trinitarians, they have to mess with it. Which is another reason why I reject the Trinity. Uh, the Trinity is a teaching that there are three separate persons. They're co-equal. Uh, and you get all these other made-up terms. God the Father is scriptural, but then you have God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. No scripture for that. Three separate persons. God in three persons. There's no scripture for that. There's only one person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, consisting of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one body. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches, whether you like it or not. Um, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, one of the most amazing verses in the New Testament. Really an eye-opening thing. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. It says, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer in adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse, okay. Went right past it to verse 3. Um, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Right? I got mess, messed up there with my chapter heading because it doesn't say verse 1. So, I've <laughs> so but uh, entertained angels. Angels unawares. New Testament. Is it possible that there are angels out there walking around right now? Oh, I saw this, you know, in the security camera footage, there was this angel appeared and had feathery wings. Uh, could you show me that in the scriptures? You say, well, cherubim, cherubim have four wings. Seraphim, that they have six wings. Okay, I've done studies on that before. An old audio sermon I did many years ago. It's not on YouTube anymore. I think it might be on another channel or two. But angels, what are they? And um, I talked about the thing of cherubim and seraphim. They're not angels. They're a different order of angelic being, but they're not angels. Or they're never called angels. And they have multiple wings. All right? uh, these feathered, the men with the feathered wings on their backs, there's not anything in scripture at all like that. Uh, they're not there. And if you can entertain an angel unawares, like Manoah did in the Old Testament, it's the angel of the Lord, it's, it's God right there, God manifest in the flesh, um, pre-incarnate form there of the flesh, probably an incorruptible form of flesh, I would imagine, uh, because he had to go, you know, go through, be born of Mary, and a body was prepared for him. And so that's what happened in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, he had a, also had a body of flesh. Um, Jesus Christ is not, you know, a spirit. He's never said to be a spirit in terms of he himself. He's the same being as the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's true. But he is not the spirit. Right? Understand that. When he speaks as God, he will refer to himself as a spirit. But when he's speaking of himself, it's the body of flesh. All right. The mystery of godliness is great. I haven't figured that out yet. And what I'm telling you can be backed up with scripture, lots of scripture, but it takes a long time to go through all the different uh, heavy doctrines of the Godhead, you know, teaching. And that's why a lot of people just, they were, oh, I don't know, I can't believe it anymore or something. Because you haven't done enough study. You haven't looked at all the arguments, looked, you've gone through all the scriptures. Very important to do that. Job chapter 1, let's go back there now, we'll have another thing to look at here in terms of... Uh, a teaching about angels, which is very interesting. Job chapter 1. 
Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to, pre to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. I remember there's some nut that wrote my ministry years ago, and uh, he was a, oh, I, I love your ministry, brother. Everything's wonderful. You're God's man for this day and age and whatever. And I... I preached a sermon about the thing of angels the one time and oh he and that sons of God are angels you know and he got all upset and oh you heretic you and just flipped I'm a God's man and everything's great and then I'm a total heretic you know that happens quite a bit but uh, this this guy was saying that this event happened here on the earth that the sons of God came and they presented themselves before the Lord and it was on the earth okay uh, no it's obviously in heaven Right, um, but then I'm going to show you the proof of that. Go to Job 38. Job 38, verse 4 through 7. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures uh, thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. How could the sons of God be there while the world is being formed if in Job chapter 1 verse 6 the sons of God are down on the earth? We say, well, they, you know, they were kind of there when Job you know, chapter 1 happened, but this is going back before then. Okay, but they're there before the earth is being formed. Before Adam and Eve would have been formed. So... Uh, no, they're angels, okay? And you compare it to New Testament scriptures, which we'll be going over, they are clearly angels. Don't fall for any of that stuff. Uh, oh, they're not angels or whatever else. Uh, yes, they are. The sons of God are there. They're shouting for joy as the world is being formed. They are definitely angels. Genesis chapter 6. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We read here, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, always a reference to angels, uh, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Uh, if you want some proof for the Bible being true and historical and everything else, where did all the uh, ancient stories of gods breeding with women and creating, you know, Hercules and other different things, you know, uh, strange offspring and whatever else, these mighty men... And whatever, they're half woman, half, you know, God, uh, it, because it was the sons of God that were coming down. Very interesting thing there. And what was God's reaction to it? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Uh, so God wasn't for this. Uh, and again, I heard some guys say, well, the sons of God, they're just the sons of Seth. That's what it means there. It's the sons of Seth. Um, no, uh, because regular men don't produce giants. Men of renown, mighty men, men of renown. That, that does, doesn't happen. There's something different going on here. And why would God be grieved at his heart by watching regular men and regular women having children? Okay, he's, you know, they're going to have these big children and whatever else, mighty men and, and things. And God's grieved at that? Doesn't make any sense. It's the sons of God, the angels, which I showed you the two passages there in Job, chapter 1, verse 6, and 38, verses 4 through 7. Right there, these sons of God are angels. That's why God's grieved. That's why they're creating giants. I know that that might not fit with your modern day scientific understanding of the world, where you think that that stuff doesn't go on anymore, but sorry, that's what the Bible teaches. Well, I don't know if I could take a stand like that. I would look stupid. I might look foolish with my peers or something. Oh, well, then you definitely have the wrong religion, right? 
Uh, God doesn't care about your peers. He doesn't care about uh, making you so that you can be popular and respected by the lost world. Go to uh, Jude chapter 1. Back to the New Testament, to the book of Jude. You know, and people get all carried away with the Nephilim and all this other stuff that you try to get the Hebrew word there so it sounds more exciting and whatever else. You don't need to do that. Uh, just go along with what the King James Bible teaches. You don't need special Hebrew or Greek words or whatever else. Um, but, you know, people try to say, well, it happened back then. Is it going to happen today? Are there Nephilim out there today? Well, the Bible says about in the days of, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be that way before the coming of the Son of Man. Paraphrasing there, Matthew chapter 24 talks about that. They were marrying and giving in marriage and whatever. Well, what was the marriage that was specifically mentioned in Genesis chapter 6? It was the sons of God coming into the daughters of men and bearing giants. So that stuff is probably going on right now. And um, like so many other things, the media just doesn't cover it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to make myself look stupid because of this book. You know that? And I hope that you feel the same way. If this book says it, I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to preach it. That's what it is. Just how it is. Uh, Jude, chapter 1, verse 6. There's only one chapter, but you get the point. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, I go through the Bible and I simply interpret certain things. And I look at things and I say, okay, well, this would line up with that and whatever else. But I've seen enemies of the scriptures and they'll go through and they'll say, well, the sons of God are, they're not, you know, angels. They're just the sons of Seth. They're regular men. And then they have to mess with the scriptures back there. You know, God's grieved at his heart because regular men are having children with regular women. You know, the daughters of men. Uh, no, uh, that doesn't work. And then they'll, you come to a verse like this, and they'll say, the angels which kept not their first estate. What's that about? Um, uh, and then they'll come up with some other theory to try to explain this away. Um, I look at this, and I just say, you know what? It makes sense. The angels that didn't keep their first estate, which kept not their first estate, they left heaven and came down to the daughters of men. They looked at them, and they saw that they were fair, and they said, hmm, you know, let's go down there and, and impress these women with our, you know, ultra strength and whatever else. I believe that that's what the Bible's teaching right here. Um, but notice it says there, uh, which kept not their first estate, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Uh, when are these angels judged? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to tie all this stuff together about, you know, what women look like in heaven and the whole thing here. But I need to lay the groundwork first for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Hmm. How much more things that pertain to this life? How are we going to be judging angels? That kind of weird? First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Go back there. Um, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Who are the sons of God in the Old Testament? That would have been the angels. Hmm. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Almost like we've replaced the angels that fell, that kept not their first estate. Now are we the replacement for them? Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
And every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now, if you want to go with the simple English, it's pretty clear right there. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Does it say sons and daughters? No. Were there any sons and daughters of God in the Old Testament? Were there ever any female angels in the Old Testament? No, there weren't. I mean, let's just be honest about this. Uh, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Uh, it doesn't appear what we shall be. You don't get saved and all of a sudden you become an angel right away, a son of God, in terms of just you take on the form that you'll have in heaven. No, it doesn't appear yet what, what we shall be. And if you're a Christian saved sister, it doesn't appear yet what you're going to be. You see, but I could still be a woman in heaven. We'll get back to that. Um, but we know that when he shall appear, Jesus Christ, we shall be like him. Well, it says like him, though. It doesn't say that we'll be the same as him. Well, obviously, we can't be God. Sure. But if it's female becoming, you know, that they're still female, how could you say you're like him? You know, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, you're teaching us. Just stick with me through the study. Okay. A little surprise at the end. Just please stick with me. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was, was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Hmm. More angels coming down. Interesting. They might be coming down and start to see some of the women and say, hey, that's a... Make some weird offspring. And don't tell me that the woman, women out there wouldn't be perverted enough that they would say, oh, you're an angel? Oh, they'd be lined up to fornicate with that guy. You know they would. Uh, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser, accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Remember that. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Hmm. Who is it in context here? Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser, accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them, the brethren, before our God day and night. And they... The brethren overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. It's an interesting thing because we overcome the wicked out there and things by the blood of the lamb, the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross. That washes our sins away. But it also says there, and by the word of their testimony. I can tell you I am a living example of how God's grace can change an old, miserable, rotten sinner. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to me. He changed my life. The word of my testimony is very important. So you get these people that they say, I'm a Christian, and they have a, a rotten testimony. And they live like the world, they act like the world, look like the world, the whole thing. Um, that's a problem. And if you want to get all philosophical and say, well, brother, but you, you know, technically... Technically, you could still be saved, and technically, you could do this sin. Technically, you could say these things, and technically, um, or you can just play it safe and say, you know what? I want to see a changed life there. I want to make sure that my life changed. I want to make sure that the Holy Spirit moved into my body and that I now have a different attitude. I want to make sure of my reservation, you see. Uh, hey, I'm going to get on the computer and I'm just going to type in, I want to fly to some place and I click, you know, okay and, and uh, whatever. And um, did you say, did they send you a confirmation email? Oh, no, I don't need that. I, that's fine. I'll just show up at the airport when it's time to leave and say, you know, hey, I'm ready to go. Uh, no, you want a confirmation email that the you're, you were booked onto that flight and you probably want a phone call and make sure everything's fine. I'm, I'm definitely going to be leaving on the flight. 
and yet people just are flippant with their eternal destination. It's always boggled my mind. Make sure. Don't play around with salvation. Revelation chapter 19. But remember, your testimony is important. The testimony of saved brethren. Revelation 19 and verse 10. And if you look at context here, you have to go back into the previous chapters. John is speaking to an angel. Okay? Verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Okay? Um, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And you say, well, that could be that, you know, he's... He's a fellow servant there of John and of his brethren. Uh, no, I don't think that that's what it means. I think it means that he's another saint there. He's an angel, an angel of the Lord there. And I don't mean the angel of God, God or the angel of the Lord. I'm saying he's an angel there. It's a redeemed saint is what I believe is going on there. I know, uh, I think Ruckman, the one time he insinuated, he said that, you know, maybe that was Daniel and that... Uh, because Daniel in the Old Testament, he actually allows Nebuchadnezzar to bow down to him and, and everything after he interprets the dream. And he doesn't say anything, you know, and, and he said it may be that, you know, in eternity, Daniel's there and, and, um, and he's there and, and John falls down to worship and he says, see, they'll do it not. <laughs> you know, I don't want to have to answer for that again. It's an interesting theory, but, you know. The thing of the testimony of Jesus, you know, yeah, I don't know. Daniel really doesn't have that same salvation like we do. Romans chapter 6. Daniel is an Old Testament saint. We are New Testament saints. Not quite the same thing. Romans chapter 6. I'll get there here. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing, okay, um, I guess I'm just reading to verse 5. Yeah, the likeness of his resurrection there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 through 12 says here, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is, is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Um, yeah. Just trying to see where I'm reading to here with my notes. But notice it says there, when I was a child, you're a child in this life. I spake as a child, I understood as a child. We don't understand everything about what we're going to have in heaven. More on that later. Um, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You say, well, the man in the sense of mankind and whatever. But what if it's that we all become men? Very literal interpretation. Yes, very literal indeed. Romans chapter 8. And here's a really strong one. You say, well, you know, we shall, you know, the first John chapter three, verses one through three says that we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. But it says like, see, it's just like. It doesn't say that we're the same or whatever. Well, then what do you do with this? Romans chapter eight, verse 29 says here, 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Conformed to the image of his Son. Is Jesus a woman? No. If you're conformed to the image of his Son, I think that that means you're going to be a man. That's why I've taught this thing for years. There's a lot of scriptures that are pretty clear about it. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 17 down through verse 21. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Would our include both men and women? Yes. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Conf fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now if you just take the Bible literally. What, can, what do you do with that? Fashioned like unto his glorious body. Pretty much looks to me like of everybody looks like Jesus Christ when we get up there to heaven. Which, you know, I've heard the joke before. It'd be kind of weird for the Catholics if some Catholic would end up getting saved and they, they still think that Mary is, you know, some kind of venerated saint or whatever. Get up there and they're looking for Mary. And oh, here comes a guy that looks like Jesus Christ. Oh, hi, I'm Mary. <laughs> Whoa, Okay. Or I get the Catholics, all these lost Catholics at the Great White Throne Judgment, and they're they're there and they're you know standing before the Lord at the Great White Throne Judgment, and they're looking around for Mary. You know, uh, maybe I can you know God looks pretty angry at me, but uh, maybe if I can find his mother someplace, you know, Mary, 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 here, girl, you know, a little sarcasm, and you know this guy steps out, looks like Jesus, and he says, "Hi, I'm Mary." <laughs> oh boy. Oh, I can't accept it. I can't accept it. See, that's the big problem. We'll get back to that in a little bit. You can't accept it because it goes against uh, what your your feelings are. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 10. Let's read this. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Hmm. The head of the woman is the man. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, forasmuch as he is the image and glory of God. Does it say that about the woman? The image? No. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. God creates Adam, and then he created Eve as a helpmeet. Eve comes from Adam. You see? Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this calls all the woman to have power on her head because of the angels? Okay, some really de deep spiritual stuff right there. Um, some pretty amazing stuff. But look at verse 10. Or, okay, I guess that is verse 10. See, the problem I'm having here, just let me pause this here for a minute. Uh, these notes were written a few days ago. And I apologize. I've been trying to get back to the study. And I've had a lot of things going Um so, a little scatterbrained up here. Please forgive me. I could edit all this out and, and make it look like a real nice polished sermon, but I don't really do it that way. Um, 
I want to be real. But uh, an interesting thing there. The woman is supposed to be have a spiritual covering over her in some way, you know, either a husband or a father or a preacher, a preacher or another saved brother or whatever. She should have a spiritual covering there. And if she doesn't, the angels actually start looking at her and thinking, hmm, I wonder if I can mess her up. Now, how many women with all the modern feminist movement and everything else, how many women are looking pretty attractive to those angels right now? There's no man over them, spiritual protection. They're out on their own. They're doing their thing. I'm a sassy career woman and whatever. You know, you'll be sassy, all right. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Um, again, you know, women are the weaker vessel. What the Bible says. And women shouldn't fight that. They shouldn't say, I'm just as good as a man. I mean, would it make sense if I said I'm just as good as a woman? <laughs> I'm just as dainty as a woman. You know, okay, I, I can be just as feminine as a woman, you know. I don't think it's right to, to you know, kind of say that I'm not as, as uh, you know, huh? No. I mean, I realize that the, that the perverted satanic media out there, they're trying to get people to that point where men can be in touch with their feminine side and wear high heels and whatever else. It's an abomination. It's disgusting. It's confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. Never forget that. But uh, verse 4 there, let it be the hidden man of the heart. So a woman says, I, I can't believe I'm going to be a, a woman or a man in eternity. Well, you already have a hidden man in your heart. Kind of an interesting thing there. Romans chapter 7. Go back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Verse 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. All right. Concept. Okay. A woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as her husband liveth. What happens to a married couple? My wife and I were both born again. We're both saved. What happens when the catching up of the body of Christ occurs? Is my wife bound to me for all of eternity? Think about that. I mean, I never died. See? We which are alive and remain shall be called up together to meet the Lord in the air. Dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. So, how does that work? If there are women in heaven and a woman, her husband dies and a few years later she dies, well, what happens in heaven? 
you know, because he died, is she loosed from her husband? And now they're just kind of up there and they, you know, do they live together? Uh, what if you have the Apostle Paul? He never got married, at least according to the scriptures that we know of. And there's no scripture about that. He's a single man. He talks about being a single man. Um, is he single for all of eternity? Is Paul's, you know, place next door to my place and my wife and, and you know, she's in there making a meal for me or something? Or, well, you say we won't be eating meals and things. Okay. But still, you know, what happens? Does my wife live with me in my mansion for all of eternity? You know? What if you have a woman that, you know, it says there, um, you know, uh, verse 3, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. See, you get into this weird thing. What do you do with that? Okay? A woman married to a saved man. The saved man dies. She's saved. She says, okay, I can get married to another. She gets married to another. Catching up happens. Up, she, up they go. Oh, hey, Joe, uh, I'd like to meet you here to Fred. You know, he's my second husband. And because he was alive at the time of the catching up, well, I guess I'm going to be with him for all of eternity. Huh? You know? And you know, I realize some of the stuff we don't really, you can't really figure out completely. I don't know. The Lord hasn't revealed it all. But uh, it, for the sisters in the Lord out there, they're saying, I don't, I can't imagine ever being a man. Well, there's some benefits to it. You know, I mean, I love my wife very dearly. She's my very best friend on the earth. You know, my son, he's kind of a different level of, of love and appreciation for him. He's our little boy and things. I delivered him, you know, and myself and, uh, he's also my friend, but it's a different thing, you know, different relationship, father and son versus husband and wife. I love my wife very much. But uh, spending eternity together in terms of we're living in the same place or whatever else, I mean, we have a lot of good times, but we still have our arguments. Well, we'll be perfect then and we won't argue and think, okay. <laughs> but, you know, you know the funny thing? There are times when God takes my wife away from me. I mean, I tell her to do something. And I say, could you please look into this? Could you please do this thing here? Fill this, you know, tax stuff out or do whatever. And I come in and she says, oh, honey, you are not going to believe what the Lord showed me. You're just not going to believe this, right? You know, and I say, did you get the work done I told you to? No, I didn't get a chance to. I was, I went to look at this thing and I was trying to get through this last chapter of this book before I go on to this other thing. And I found this name here and, and, and look at this, this ties into this. And I had to look up some stuff on the internet. And I've seen the Lord just take my wife and just say, hey, Brian, uh, yeah, just shut up. You go off to the side. I have some work for her to do. And he'll reveal some amazing thing to her. I mean, a lot of the studies, it's stuff that he's shown to my wife. And I had no part in it. And it literally just, you know, felt if we were all in the same room, the Lord just say, hey, sit down over there in the corner. You know, Brian, just go sit down, be quiet. I'm going to be dealing with her now. But when we get to heaven, it's going to be some kind of a thing where we're married or how does that work? And how does that make you feel if you're single? You never were able to marry, you know, in this life. And you always wanted to. And you get up to heaven and you get to watch my wife and I walking by. And all the other married, saved saints walking by. There's a single woman over there. She's just three mansions down, you know. Oh, uh, Lord, couldn't we, you know, kind of. I mean, there won't be any intimacy. I'm... You know, I doubt that in heaven, but, you know, the whole point is just the companionship. Marriage is a lot more than intimacy. That is there. It's important, but there's companionship. And there's being able to talk about, you know, different things and go over the scriptures together and study the word together and things. Marriage is a good thing, mostly. <laughs> there's the times of struggling with the flesh like the Bible warns about. But you see what, you see what I'm saying here? If what we have here goes on into eternity... It could actually turn into some weird things. And, you know, for saved women out there, there's times that you know that your saved husband, if you are blessed enough to have a saved husband, there are some times you think that guy's got rocks for brains. He does some really stupid things. I mean, my wife never experiences that with me because I'm perfect. But uh, do you really want to be married to that knucklehead for all of eternity? See? See? We should be married to another, even to Jesus Christ. Hmm. 
Remember that. Married to another. We'll get back to that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11. You say, wow, the, huh, the Bible teaches that saved women become men. And it's just this masculine, you know, like this uh, Volhul, you know, the, the uh, Nordic thing, the Viking thing in the Norse sagas and whatever else, Valhalla, they call it the English. That's kind of the Victorian era. They made it more exciting, I guess, by calling it Valhalla. But... Uh, <laughs> this thing of these these viking warriors and they're up there fighting and you know they kill each other and then they they come back to life every day and they go and they drink beer and they and they're just fighting and killing all the time up there in valhalla <laughs> you know it sounds like that's what it's going to be you know there's not going to be any feminine whatever stuff and whatever it's just going to be men up there we're all going to be just you know bearded men just you know let's go to battle come on let's get down there battle of armageddon yeah come on let's fight is that what it's going to be <laughs> I personally like the sound of that, you know, kind of thing, not to drinking a beer and whatever, but getting ready to fight. I mean, there is the fight between Michael and his archangels, or Michael and his angels, and the devil and his angels in Revelation 12 that we read earlier, so there will be some fighting. Um, but what about a female influence in heaven? See, I've showed you the scriptures that are very plain, saying that we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is. We shall be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, that stuff is there. But is there a female aspect to what goes on there in heaven? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Um, I think I have the wrong verse. Uh, now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, head of Christ is God. Yeah, it's not, it's not the right verse. Let's check uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Yeah, verse 1 and 2. Well, 1 through 3. Excuse me. Got the wrong uh, thing there. The wrong book. <laughs> excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. <laughs> I'm glad I have some things in common with the Apostle Paul. Bear with me a little in my folly, brethren. I'm not perfect. And indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Oh, wait a second. We're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, but here it says that we get presented as a chaste virgin to Christ. And compared to Eve? Huh. Revelation chapter 19. Let's go back there. Revelation chapter 19. Verses 5 through 9. It says here, And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Allelu Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of female saints. Now it says saints. Hmm. And he said, and he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. See where I'm reading to. Okay. Um, <laughs> hmm. Isn't this kind of making a problem a little bit? 
Well, if you want to be super dogmatic about uh, that we all become men in heaven, then yeah. Um, you say, well, maybe we're just men, but we, you know, there's some kind of a female thing there or something, or, you know, because we're called bride and her and she. Well, it's some kind of perverted thing or whatever. Well, if you have a perverted mind, you could probably start coming up with some stuff. But uh, I just read the Bible as it is. Revelation chapter 21, go over there now, verses 1 and 2. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Jump down to verse 9 of the same chapter, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9 through 11. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Hmm. You say, well, see, Brian, it's about the city. You're such a dummy. It's New Jerusalem. That's the, the bride. How does a city look like a bride? All right. Not to mention the fact that Paul says, I'm, God, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's not talking to a city. He's talking to people. Say, so say, wait a second. <sighs> You're contradicting yourself down there. You're contradicting yourself. So we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We're going to, to look like him, um, see him as he is. We shall be like him. All these verses you're saying, that, you know, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. They're male. But now you're saying it's going to be a bride. We're going to be, there's going to be some kind of a female thing there. What are you trying to say? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to give you the absolute truth now. How to tie the whole thing together. Ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. You'll have no doubt about me after this verse, is, or after I'm going to be done reading these verses. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. I've demonstrated that very well in this study. Not intentionally either. Declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Um, Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I can tell you about that. I know that one. Okay? Verse 3. And I was with you in, meekness, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden Wisdom it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Uh, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You realize if all these wicked people out there, room, 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 going up and down, whatever else, all these wicked people, if they actually knew the truth of who Jesus was, and if they actually knew what this book was, really was and what this book could give them in the future, they wouldn't be crucifying the Lord of glory. They wouldn't be crucifying this book and laughing at this book and mocking this book. It's all about ready to come to pass. All the things this book talks about. And these people are completely unprepared. Just like back there in the first century. Who is this guy? He says he's God. He's homeless. He's a homeless carpenter. He's a Jew. Are you kidding me? Yeah, they crucified him? Oh, good. Whatever, you know, with the two thieves, well, that's appropriate. Yeah, you know, whatever. Well, he's dead and he's buried, you know, now. Forget about it. Three days later, you know, 
They're saying he came up from the dead? Oh, please. Nobody believes that. 500 people? You know, brethren, all their followers of this. What was his name again? Oh, Jesus, yeah. But boy, when those princes of the world died, the emperors, the Roman emperors and things, well, emperor that was there, um, when he died, boy, he had a shock, didn't he? Takes his last breath. Wakes up. Jesus. It was all real. And I didn't listen. That's why we preach Jesus. We can talk about other things, brethren, what we might look like in heaven and whatever else, but uh, always remember it's about Jesus Christ and the authority of the Scriptures. That's what it's about. Verse 9. You say, well, Brian, I don't understand what this has to do with uh, what are we going to look like in heaven? Are, are women going to become men in heaven, brother? Uh, give me the, the scriptures. Okay. But as it is written, I hath not seen, doth not yet appear what we shall be, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Do you love the Lord? say, yes, I do. I really do. Praise the Lord. That's great to hear. Um, you know what? One of the things that a loving father likes to do for his children, he likes to get gifts for them and prepare gifts for them. Um, that's why I like Christmas time. You don't have to like Christmas time. It's optional. Romans chapter 14 says that you can esteem one day above another. It doesn't matter. Every man esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You don't have to celebrate anything. But I like to get my son a gift. I have some gifts right now. His birthday is coming up early September. And I have some gifts already that he doesn't know about. And I can't wait to give those gifts to him. And I give him some clues once in a while. And he'll, oh, Father, come on, please tell me, please, please. No. And, and it's sometimes I'll even joke with him. I'll say, okay, all right, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Oh, really? What is it? What is it? I say, it's a secret. Oh, you can't do that. You have to let me know. We get that way with the Lord, don't we? Lord, I want to know. I want to know. Are women going to be men in heaven? I mean, there's the scriptures. There's a bunch of scriptures. And the Lord says, uh, yeah, but there's some scriptures pointing the other way too. The bride, herself, she. Uh, yeah. Could you please just kind of show me? The Lord says, no, oh, that ruined the surprise. I can't wait to give you these surprises. I have some good stuff ready for you. And you know what, brethren? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Uh, you want to believe that women, there will be women in heaven. You're a sister in the Lord. You say, I'm going to go. I'm going to be up there. And I'm going to retain my people see me. And they'll say, oh, hey, it's sister so-and-so. Good for you. You want to do that? Fine. Whatever. But remember that God has a surprise. And whatever his surprise is for you, it's going to be glorious and it's going to be wonderful. Not going to be like a little brat. You get up there and you, you know you see the brats on Christmas morning. They go, I didn't want this. They throw it down. No, no, not with the Lord. No. If I get up there and the Lord says, I'm going to turn you into a blue giraffe, Brian, because I want you to be a blue giraffe. I'll say, okay, you know, point me to where the trees are that I can eat the leaves off the trees. Doth not yet appear what we shall be. Uh, you know, you're going to be a perfect, you know, look alike for Jesus Christ, Brian. Well, okay. Uh, hey, Brian, you're going to, you know, look like a bride or something like that. Well, you're going to have to do something about this because this, I'm not going to look good in a, a nice white linen dress or something. So do something about this, please. I, you know, I don't want to bring, you know, make heaven look ugly or something. <laughs> it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But he has it figured out. And whatever his decision is, we're all going to be happy with it. If you're born again. Heaven, and, always remember the, the very simple, neat statement. This isn't in the scriptures, but it's very true of what's coming. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Heaven is not a place where all your favorite things from the earth are waiting for you up there. No, it's about Jesus Christ and us worshiping Jesus Christ for all of eternity. 
that's what it's going to be. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You see, we already have the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about the spirit of your mind. Okay? So the spirit, the mind of Christ, is the spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit already resides in us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, um... Does the King James Bible teach that women become men in heaven? Well, there are some scriptures that make it look that way. Um, but then there are scriptures that plainly say that there are there's a female type of a thing there in heaven. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest. I mean, you know, I've seen this thing from some of the my mentors in the faith. Um, men that I highly respect and whatever else. Uh, and... You can go through the Bible and you can pick out, out a bunch of things that kind of line up with what you're trying to say, but then if there's some verses that kind of contradict it, you just say, well, uh, yeah, we'll get into that some other time. You know, we'll just kind of study that some other time. Okay, thank you for coming. And, uh, um, I'm going to be trying, I'm going to try to be as honest as I can with you. And if the scriptures don't teach certain things, I'm just not, I can't go and say, oh, the Bible definitively says, that yes, we become men in heaven. I don't know. It looks that way, but what's with the female thing? The bride of Christ that's up there. The chaste virgin. You know, that's compared to Eve. I have no idea. And you don't either. But why? Well, it does not yet appear what we shall be. So, uh, hopefully that study has been a blessing to you as it's, it was a blessing to me. Um... <laughs> took me a little while to get back into the thing of preaching, uh, get away from it and get out into the world for a few days and you get back with the Lord and, you know, it's kind of you go into battle and you have your sword out and you're, you're you know, there and every day you're just fighting and you get into really good shape and then you're out of war for a few days and you start to get kind of a little bit complacent and whatever and you're not fighting and then you go back into battle and you're thinking, oh, and you're, and you're really rusty with fighting same thing happens when you get away from the bible i haven't been away from the bible but i'm saying just some secular things i need to take care of uh some work around here and vehicle issues and things like that so just been trying to get to doing this study and it's been rough um again all day i was running doing errands this morning and things so um but that's going to be it for this study and uh I have a big announcement coming out next month in August. I'm not going to say what it is yet, but uh, it'll be a big announcement. Real big thing that's happening with the ministry. And um, so please look forward to that. Please keep us in your prayers. And thank you to all those out there that donate to the ministry. Um, please like and subscribe. Uh, it's important for me to say that because otherwise this channel just gets buried. It has been buried for a long time. Because I usually just preach the word and that's where it ends. Um, but I realize, you know, unfortunately with computer technology stuff as it is right now with the algorithms and all the other stuff, if you don't say certain things then they just bury you and, and then you can't find it and it's not searchable and all the other stuff, this ministry could really become huge if you help me out there. Um, and one of the best ways that you can help me, the best way is, of course, prayer. I need your prayers. Uh, very important. Um, donations to the ministry I appreciate that this channel is not monetized I put that at the end of the videos a lot of times but thirdly um, try to help the ministry share the videos with people send links and, and things like that uh, what they do to shadow ban me 
try to undo that by you know getting the word out and whatever else so um, another study to do today so I need to get to that one but uh, again I apologize for being a little bit scatterbrained through the study but um, that is going to be it and we'll see you in the next video thank you very much for watching